October is National Bullying Prevention Month. And we are here today um, celebrating ways that we as a community, all of our stakeholders can come together to make this world a better place for our students, for our community, for our staff, for everyone in general. So we are celebrating Unity Day on October the 18th. But as we get started with Unity Day, we wanna share more information with all of you. So today we have with us the CEO of the Megan Meyer Foundation that's located here in St. Charles County. And we have Tina Myers here to tell us a little more about her organization and how we can best support our students. So thank you so much, Tina, for being here. If you would give me one second, I'm gonna switch our screens to get you set up. Um, but if you'd like to go ahead and introduce yourself, that would be great. Okay, wonderful. So I am grateful to be here. Um, anytime that I can speak in a community that I live in, that we serve our clients, it's so important. Um, I apologize for my voice. I'm a little bit under the weather, so this is not the typical sound. Um, so I started the Megan Meyer Foundation back in 2007, and the foundation's mission is to support and inspire actions to end bullying, cyberbullying, and suicide. And really what that means is that we within the foundation want to be able to go into schools and whether we are providing free counseling to students or we're talking to parents or educators um, about these issues of bullying and cyberbullying, what we want to make sure that you understand is, is that there's so many layers to the word bullying and cyberbullying that it's not just something that you can see so easily. Many times these are small actions, small things that have taken period over a period of time. It could be a period of years. And many times it can be really, really hard to be able to see. Um, one thing also I wanna make sure is that you know that bullying and cyberbullying are not a direct link to suicide. So that is not something that we are stating. These presentations are meant to bring awareness um, to educate us and try to promote us to be able to think about things in a different way, have conversations with students, have conversations with our, our children, to be able to discuss and talk more about the things that they're going through every day. Um, so I just want to make sure that, that everybody knows this is not a fear-based presentation. I started the foundation, again, because of my daughter, Megan. You know, Megan was this really happy-go-lucky kid, um, and she entered kindergarten, right? She was happy, excited about it. But Megan was a bigger girl. So by that, I mean is Megan was taller than the other kids. Megan looked like she was in second grade compared to the kids in kindergarten. Kids would, you know, look at her, and they visually could see she was taller. So they would make comments like she was a giant. And then they started noticing that her legs are bigger than theirs and then became the mean names of, you know, you have big legs or thunder thighs or you're going to break the chair, you know, and we know that kids say things to one another, right? When Megan came home and told me what the kids were saying, I did the typical thing of, honey, don't worry about these other kids, right? You're, you're perfect the way you are. Listen, we're all different. Some of us are taller and shorter, right? We have different hair color. That's what makes the world a better place. And I would say those same statements and I would give her a hug, tell her things are gonna be fine. And I would send her back off to school. Megan in third grade. Um, now I will tell you, Megan had friends. Megan was not the kid that um, was bullied so extreme where it was the physical or the verbal assaults where you could see that or adults could see it happening. These things happened under the radar, right? It was little comments, little things that would happen throughout the day, um, throughout the years. And I encouraged her again to keep talking and, and hanging out with other friends that wouldn't say mean things. In third grade, Megan was struggling to the point that I could not get her to sleep. Megan said, you know, as I was trying to ask her, why are you crying? Why won't you go to bed? What's happening? And she told me that she wanted to kill herself. And for a third grade child saying this, 
I was petrified. I had no clue of where this came from. I, we never talked about it. And I thought, not my kid. I panicked. I sobbed. I went, you know, trying to figure out like, what do I do with my kid? And I thought, do I call 911? Do I call her pediatrician? Do I call my mom? Like, I didn't know what to do. And I went and I, I sat down with her again. And I said, Megan, honey, talk to me. Why would you say this? Because my thought was, Tina, maybe you're overreacting. Maybe she really didn't know what the meaning was. She Maybe she just heard it. Well, Megan knew exactly what it meant. Um, when Megan, I asked her why she would feel that way. She said, everybody hates her. She hates herself. I slept with her that night. I took her to the pediatrician the next day because I was petrified. The pediatrician said, Tina, you know what? She really needs to be, you know, evaluated by a psychiatrist and a psychologist. She really needs to go in and see where things are at. As we know, even in today's world, even if you have insurance, it is still hard many times to get into a psychiatrist, to get an evaluation. Um, and it was the same during that time. I made calls for days and finally did get Megan in after a couple of months. Megan was diagnosed with depression and ADHD. We did do medication. We did start therapy. Um, I was scared to do that. I was scared for the medication part because I had never really understood the world of really mental health. We did. We never really talked about that. And I didn't really know anybody in my family that struggled with it. So I was afraid giving a medication would completely change her personality. After the long discussions with the doctors and her therapist, um, we did start that medication. You know, she entered fourth grade and fourth grade was probably one of her best years. And truly, yes, therapy was helping. I think the medication helped her take a deep breath um, before she reacted many times. But it was also her fourth, fourth grade teacher that really saw Megan for Megan. And it was so amazing to see the change in that child. Um, you know, I think many times children who struggle, um, especially with ADHD um, on the spectrum, struggle with any type of um, mental illness that they are, their behaviors, um, they don't socially interact quite the same that kids do that are neurotypical. And so what tends to happen with these kids is that they struggle with friendships, right? It's kind of this roller coaster where one day they're friends and then one day they're not because maybe they were too loud or maybe they took their stuff, whatever it may be. And then typically with teachers, these are the kids that usually speak out of turn. They're typically the kids that forget things. They're typically the kids that don't sit in their seat very well. Um, and so they get reprimanded quite a bit. Parents typically get calls or notes home. And then when they get home as a parent and I get notes or I see that she forgot things or she said she had a project to do, to do tomorrow that could have taken two weeks to do it. Um, you know, we get frustrated too. And many times these kids are in this 24 hour circle of feeling the words that kids will tell me is that they are a disappointment, that they are um, bad. They're bad kids. And I never really saw it at the time with Megan. I always thought I was trying to encourage her, trying to keep her moving forward. But looking back on it now, I can absolutely see where they're always feeling like they are the bad kid. Megan, um, but this year, this teacher saw the great stuff in her and was able to get her to do things that Megan never did before. And um, I thought maybe these are the, this is kind of where she was at, what she needed. Megan entered through now fifth grade and now went into sixth grade, sixth, seventh and eighth grade. Um, middle school is the toughest years for sure. We know that from research that sixth grade, the spring of sixth grade is the peak of bullying. And it is because children in elementary school many times are, you know, parents are more involved. 
Um, they don't have to switch classes quite as much. There's a little bit more protection there. And when they go into middle school, they are then, you know, trying to be given responsibilities and, you know, they have to switch classes and they now are integrated with different kids from different schools many times. And so kids are always trying to figure this out. And by the time spring hits is where they have figured out wherever that hierarchy is at, where do they fit in? Where are the cool kids? What is the cool thing to do? what to not do, and you will start seeing these separations happening quite often. Megan um, certainly struggled through that, but you know the thing was, it, the, the bullying that was happening to her was so under the radar that many times she did not tell me. Teachers did not notice, and that was until seventh grade hit. Um, seventh grade, Megan stopped eating lunch. She didn't tell me that she did. I found out because she had no money in her lunch account. And so I went up to her school when I noticed and I gave the lunch attendant money. And I said, hey, listen, I, I must have completely forgotten. Megan never told me. And I here is some money. But when I looked over, I saw Megan sitting at a table with a water bottle and a napkin. All the other kids were eating. I didn't want to embarrass her. I asked the lunch attendant, will you just please go tell her that she has money in her account to go get some food? She comes home that afternoon from school. I said, hey, did the did you eat lunch today? And she said, yeah. And I said, oh, good. The lunch attendant told you you had money. I said, next thing, you've got to talk to me and tell me I didn't. Back then, you needed to be responsible to make sure. And Megan said, oh, okay, fine. I said, what have you been doing? Oh, I've been eating lunch. And then I knew that something didn't seem right. And I said, Megan, what is going on? And she finally told me that these boys, you know, as part of this popular group, you know, during the lunch line would stomp behind her, calling her a fat cow and an elephant making animal noises. She just stopped eating lunch. And I said, Megan, honey, you've got to, I've told you about these boys before. If you just ignore them, They'll get bored and tired and they'll move on. I had been telling Megan this for years. And Megan looked at me and said, Mom, could you do that if it was you? You know, so often I think as adults, we one kind of repeat the things that we were always taught, right? The things that we went through, how we handled certain situations. Um, and I think that we are fixers. We want to fix situations, get it moving on. We want to let kids know this is temporary. It's going to be fine. Once you get past it, everything's going to be fine. But what we fail to do so many times is to really stop, really listen to the words that they're saying, hearing that, how could I do that if it was me? And would these words, would these actions that I'm telling them, would those help? And when Megan did that, it, it made me stop and think of like, I couldn't go to work. I don't, it's not that I, uh, anybody would have to physically attack me or verbally assault me, but if a, a coworker comes up and just makes a comment about my weight, makes a comment about my relationship that I have, or if I'm struggling or going through troubles or about my kids of, oh, I heard they're not doing too well, or I heard they're this. I mean, if they just said something small, quiet, and negative about something personal to me, and I'm just then supposed to go back to, to work and just be fine, that's not going to work. And it doesn't work for kids. And I said, Megan, I'm sorry, you're right. I'm going to go to the school because you can't keep going through this. She flipped out, begged me not to go to the school, said, mom, you're going to make it 10 times worse. I said, Megan, what do you want me to do? And she said, nothing, mom, please just let me do it on my own. I was trying to let her work through some things. And so I did not go to the school. I told her if I saw things starting to get worse, that I was going to have to step in. Things did start getting worse. Um, Megan's grades were dropping. Her, um, She was taking a zero in gym, would not participate. And that was because, you know, the boys thought it would be funny to make fun of her while she was in gym. It got to the point that I couldn't take it any longer. And we had to look for a different school because Megan cried every morning going to school. 
every afternoon. And, and the thing is, it wasn't that the school was a bad school, right? It, it wasn't. The fact was, is that the school could not go to every corner of a school, making sure that every student that is going to continually through these years say something negative or mean or underneath their breath, they're not going to be able to see that or get those kids to be able to stop it because they can't see it in the moment. That's the hard part about it. If you can switch to the next screen, please. So Megan went to, we started her to a, a new school. Um, it was a smaller private school and it wasn't because I thought private was better than public, not at all. It was just the a place where I thought maybe if she has a fresh start, maybe we can help, you know, try to build her confidence in herself. Throughout the years, you know, when you have a kid who struggles with self-worth and self-esteem, um, many times they will talk, doctors will talk to you about getting them involved in extracurricular activities and whatever that may look like, whether it's art or cooking or ice skating, basketball, whatever it is that they enjoy doing, getting them involved in something outside of school so that they feel like they have a connection and another set of friends to be able to rely on. We tried all of that throughout the years with Megan, believe me. Uh, Megan enjoyed to start something that sounded exciting, and then it really fizzled out pretty quickly. But this time, going into eighth grade, um, she signed up for volleyball for the new school. She started, we started meeting new friends and parents in the new school, and Megan started, you know, they had slumber parties, and they would go, you know, to the movies, and she was starting to really blossom over this summer and going into the school year. And when eighth grade started, I, it was like taking a deep breath of like, finally, she's going to start, she's getting ready to start seeing like the beauty of who she is and not taking every negative thing that these kids have said and wearing it like that's who she is. Once eighth grade started, Megan was going to be turning 14 and Megan asked if she could have a MySpace. MySpace was way back in the day, but it's the same as kids wanting to have Instagram and Snapchat and TikTok and YouTube and getting on all of these app, uh, the social media sites and apps. I was worried and I said, you know, Meg, I'm worried about sexual predators. You know, you don't know who's out there. And, you know, she she absolutely bombarded me with please, please, please for about 48 hours. I finally said, here's the thing I will let you have the MySpace account, but here's the rules. And these rules would not work in today's world with the technology. But then it was, I have the password to your account. You don't have it. Your profile has to be kept private. I have to prove anything going on your page. We made sure computers were in open spaces, not allowed in a bedroom. And I had even purchased a program that would monitor every instant message. So it was a AOL instant messenger and any website she visited. She was not thrilled with these. She told me I was a warden of a prison, um, like most teens think. But I, she started the MySpace, adding friends from her old school and friends from her new school. And things were going really well. And she got a friend request from a boy named Josh Evans. I am going to ask Adrian to please play the video from the Dr. Phil show that will finish the rest of Megan's story. And then we'll be able to talk more about some of the next steps. Cyberspace is the new venue for the schoolyard bully. Well, it's a story that's made national headlines. 13-year-old Megan Meyer committed suicide after being bullied online by who she thought was a teenage boy. But little did her parents know at the time that the bullying actually involved their adult neighbor who lived just four doors down. And the whole thing, the whole person she was talking to on the website was a hoax. It was a made up person. Take a look. Megan was 13 years old. Megan had a MySpace account and she had become friends with a boy named Josh Evans and corresponded for roughly four to six weeks. Megan received a message from Josh Evans stating that he did not want to be friends with Megan any longer, that he heard she was not a very nice person. 
Megan was absolutely getting bombarded with these insults. And she said, Mom, you know, they're just being mean to me online. I was aggravated, so I had my voice raised with her. You knew better than to stay in the MySpace. You knew the rules. She was really upset, and I said, Megan, I am really disappointed with you. And she said, you're supposed to be my mom. You're supposed to be on my side. And she took off running upstairs. And those are the last words that she said to me. Tina came into the kitchen, and we were talking about basically why was Megan on the computer. And then all of a sudden, my heart just dropped. I just had this horrible feeling. I turned around and took off her up the stairs. I heard this god-awful scream. Um, Tina called 911. Tina and I rode along in the ambulance with her, and we got to Children's Hospital, and they put her in the ICU. October 17th on Tuesday, she finally passed. They took all the uh, cords and IVs and everything off her. We just laid it. laid in the bed and held her. It's just the most um, horrible feeling that I've ever felt in my entire life. About six weeks later, we received a phone call from a neighbor down the street. She told us that she had information that the neighbor, Lori Drew, was responsible for creating this fake MySpace account. Megan had known her daughter since the fourth grade. They'd spend the night at each other's house. Lori Drew and her daughter, they created this MySpace account as a joke. They wanted to find out what Megan was saying about their daughter. Lori Drew confessed in the police report that that's why she created this Josh Evans account. I do blame Lori Drew for what happened to Megan, without a doubt. We were connected with the FBI, and through the investigation, we found out later in the spring of 2007 that there just was not a law that they could fit it into. The Drew family totally played us like fools. It is cyberbullying to the 10th degree, and the fight to me now is to fight for justice, for the laws to change. This is not just things that you see on TV. Megan was a real person, a real girl with real dreams. So I share Megan's story and video with you and with students that are from middle school and up. Again, not for sympathy. It's not fear. It is to really understand that this can now give some dialogue and conversations to talk more openly about this. You know, many times uh, schools and parents will, we always tell kids like what to do and what not to do because we hear about stories or things in the news or we read about something and it scares us. And many times if there are kids that are middle school and up, a story like Megan's at least helps kids connect so that then they are more open to be able to start talking about these issues. So instead of it being, are you bullied? Do you know anybody who is bullied? Or do you, how do you stay safe online? And they feel like they're being interrogated. Many times, if you even show them a video of Megan's or Megan's story and have them read it and say, you know, hey, if you know, if you were ever going through this or somebody, you know, what could you do? What, where would you go for help? Or how would you handle things that, you know, if you saw this happening to somebody that way you're they don't feel like they're being put on the stand and it gives them um, a way to be able to open up and start talking. Um, we do know that suicide is the second leading cause of death um, for youth 10 to 24 years old. And, you know, I think one thing that we need to know is that Talking about suicide is not going to make somebody think about suicide. It absolutely isn't. We talk about suicide to make sure that people know that there is help, that to reach out and get the supports and where to get the support so that we can help save lives. So none of us have to be experts. All we have to be able to do and know is that if somebody is talking about it, writing about it, that we make sure we talk to them and ask them, are you having thoughts of suicide? And if they are, then making sure that we have, we get them to the place. And hopefully each school um, district has their own policies and procedures for how they handle that of staying with the student 
making sure that they are connected with a school counselor, a principal, making sure that you stay there with that child until they are then given to the professional that then can be able to help them. But what we don't want to do is ever just leave them alone. And if it's a parent that has a child who does say, yes, I am having thoughts of suicide, you know, making sure that you can call and there's tons of resources on the website for the special school district, which are phenomenal, but making sure you reach out to 988, making sure you reach out to the child's primary care doctor. Um, you can reach out in locally in St. Louis. You can reach out to BHR, which is phenomenal and can provide uh, crisis support. So what the biggest thing we don't want to do is just is saying uh, it's not going to happen. It's not my kid or they're just over exaggerating. Anytime they talk about it, every time they talk about it, we need to question, ask that question and connect them to the proper services because it, it does show we can save lives. So to give you an idea of how complex suicide is, suicide is not something that they just automatically think that, yep, this is, this is the answer for me, right? Thomas Joyner is a professor out of Florida, and he has been studying why people die by suicide for over 35 years. His father died by suicide. And um, he is a phenomenal guy um, to talk to. And, you know, I've had the, the ability, which has been wonderful to be able to sit down and talk to him for hours about all of his studies and where things are coming from. And, and his theory is, is that people that have capability for suicide, they're not afraid to die. Um, that may be that things have been going on in their lives that they just have less fear. We definitely know that kids who um, ADHD, they have many times less fear. They're, they're kind of, they will jump into the middle of uh, situations quite often. So there are some, some people who are less afraid, um, take more risks. And as they take risks and they continue to increase those risks, sometimes they get to that point where it's kind of like, Eh, I'm not afraid to die, right? Or they've gone through something. Um, that thwarted belongingness is I'm alone. This one can be really hard um, to understand because many times people who are struggling, it looks on the outside like they have a ton of support, right? You're giving them support. They have a therapist. They seem to have friend support. And so it looks like how could you be alone when you have all these people supporting you? Sometimes in those places, and I only can speak from my own personal experience after Megan died, is I have never felt so alone in my life. And it was the point in my life where I had the most support ever. People surrounded me and swarmed me. But the reality was, is that I could not really hear them. It felt like 10 foot of fog that I could see them, but it was all in slow motion and I felt like I was just drifting down in this black box. And the other part is a perceived burdensomeness that they feel like they're a burden. You know, many times if you have a kid who does struggle and they know that sometimes their behaviors, um, sometimes their friendships, sometimes their relationships with their parents, they struggle. Um, they worry about parents sometimes paying bills for doctors or taking them places. They sometimes worry that it's going to upset their parents or make their parents sad. I've heard from kids say that, you know, my mom has an aneurysm. And if I tell her, I'm afraid it's going to burst. I'm afraid I'm going to hurt her or make her sad, or they don't have the money to keep going through all of this with me. It's causing a lot of family stress. And even though adults, we don't ever try to put that on those children, they hear it, they see it. And so some many times they try to protect us and they feel that burden. And then that's where, when they all three kind of collide, there is that concern for that near lethal suicide attempt. Um, and it's just making sure that we understand these different pieces are kind of what can connect and to really be able to pay attention to some of those signs. 
Now we'll swing into bullying. Okay. So we, while I said in the beginning that bullying and cyberbullying are not this direct link to suicide, what we do have to understand is that if there is if there are children who are repeatedly bullied, repeatedly cyberbullied, they do have a higher rate of thoughts of suicide and suicide attempts. And so it is important to understand that if these things continue to go on and on and on over time, we need to be able to reset, take a deep breath and really look at some changes or things that we can do. Um, one thing is that we have gotten bullying wrong many times. Um, bullying is not when somebody is rude, right? When they say something or do something unintentionally um, and they do it once, it's rude. If somebody is mean, so they say or do something that it intentionally is to try to hurt you and they do it once, that's mean. Uh, you probably don't want to hang out with them anymore. You probably want to give it some time. But if it's one time, it's mean. I want you to still understand that it's okay for us as adults to be able to, even if it happened one time, it's rude or mean. It may happen one time from that kid. It may have happened one time from another kid the week before. So it still can be embarrassing. It still can hurt. It still can make them mad or sad. So it's just validating when they say, well, they're being mean and saying these mean things. And you find out, okay, talk to me about what happened. And you find out it's one time. We don't want to say, well, it's one time they're being mean. It's not bullying. It's really of, you know, well, that is mean. And, you know, that I, you know, I'm sorry to hear that you're embarrassed and, and hurt. You know, if things are repeated, you need to be able to report it. Let me know. But you know, I'm sorry you've been hurt. Is there anything I can do, right? Because all we're doing is listening and validating their feelings at that moment. We're not fixing it, but they want to be heard. Bullying is when somebody does something intentionally um, and they repeat it over time. So in 2014, the CDC and a, pa a panel of experts updated the definition. Um, it can be in many different definitions, but the biggest things that you want to take away is bullying is um, any unwanted aggressive behaviors by youth or groups of youth who are not siblings or dating partners um, that involve an ob observed or perceived power imbalance um, repeated multiple times. The thing is this, is that when bullying happens, they direct it towards somebody or a group of kids. They typically have this imbalance of power, which means that they feel that they have the power to control those situations, say things, do things, and not much response is going to happen. And then they usually have their friends around them to kind of support them when they go in to do these types of things. And then they, you know, it's this repeating it multiple times. Now they can do it by the physical pushing, shoving, hitting, tripping, taking their belongings. It can be verbal. So name calling verbal gestures, um, and the social relational. The social relational is the one that by far my traveling, I've traveled to 39 different states over the past 14 years and spoke to thousands of students in all age ranges, public, private schools, does not matter where. And social relational is the one that is the, the worst, is what they typically say. And that is where they are excluded from situations on purpose, excluded from getting in a, a group on a recess or excluded from a friend group that they were friends with before. Um, it is rumors about them, rumors about them, their families. And a lot of times when we find out that a rumor is going out, most of us as adults say, ah, oh, don't worry about it. The reality is if a rumor was going around our workplace, right, or even our family, you do worry about it. You, you do sit back and wonder, like, why would they say that? And you try to think of ways to defend yourself. So, again, while we cannot fix rumors, it is almost impossible because they are a tangled web by the time they have gotten all over the place. And the reality is, is that even if you had scientific proof to stand up in front of an auditorium of people and say, this rumor is absolutely false. It is not true. Majority of people still believe the rumor. They just do. It's the way our world is. 
So when I talk to kids about it, explaining them to one, don't be part of the that rumor and gossip part, because the second you walk away, they talk about you, right? We This always happens. So if you don't want to be a part of that, you walk away and say, listen, I'm not dealing with rumors. I'm not dealing with drama. If it does happen to you, you cannot push and shove 5 million people and get them to believe you. So if you're the kid, it is basically trying to know in your heart what is the truth, talking to your core friends, making sure that they're going to stand by you and support you. And then for adults to understand that not to just say, don't worry about it, to say that can be really hurtful and it can be really hard. You know, I'm here to talk to you or here, I'm here to listen. Any support that we can offer where we can't fix it, but we can be there just to support them and listen to them is crucial. Cyberbullying. So cyberbullying is anything really, it's just kind of transcends to electronics, right? So if they use a cell phone, I don't care what kind, if they use a computer, if they use an iPad, they're on a gaming device, um, it does not matter where they're at, what they're on. If that is being used to repeatedly send um, willful and repeated uh, names or um, pictures to be able to threaten, um, harass them, humiliate them, that is considered cyberbullying. A one-time message from somebody going to another person is not considered cyberbullying, even though it can reach many more people. That's the hard part about it. Um, if you can go ahead and flip, please. So where do we think cyberbullying takes place? It takes place in group chats. It takes place on Xbox Live. It takes place on you know, Snapchat, Instagram. Pinterest, I don't care what they're on. It is always available. Um, kids will find a way if they want to, to be able to send repeated hurtful messages. Um, they do it many times where they'll create fake accounts and they will send messages out. They will send and, you know, re-image um, a photo and send it out. Or if they're spending the night at each other's house, they will then think it's funny to take videos and then they cut them down and send those pieces out. And it's, you know, it, it is so extremely hard when you're going through that. Um, what we always talk to kids about is if you are the one that is has somebody who is repeatedly sending messages about you, targeting you with taking your photos, manipulating it, um, make sure that you won take a deep breath. Do not respond. Do not share the photos or the messages, the videos. It, it will not work by spreading that around. The other thing is, is to take screenshots. Make sure that you have screenshots of what is happening. Then we want them to be able to report it to the internet service provider, report that there are harmful messages or that this is a fake image of them whatever it may be, and make sure that they take a screenshot of that, that they have reported it. And then we want them to be able to block the person and talk to a trusted adult. Um, this means if there's parents out there, um, when you talk to them as a trusted adult, you need to be able to know that when you've talked to kids overall about social media and using electronics, if you have threatened and said, listen, if there's anything that goes on, I've told you I don't like this stuff anyways, then we're just shutting it off. We're shutting it down. I don't want to deal with any of these issues. They're not going to come to you and talk to you about things unless it escalates so badly that they don't know what to do. So instead, we talk to parents about in the beginning or even right now, if it happens, sharing them Megan's story or another story and talking to them about why it's important to be able to be safe online and what are some steps to do. That way, if you can all agree on, if this happens, here are some things to do. Let's write it down. What works? What doesn't work? How do we work this in our own home? Because you want them to be able to come to you, not fearful that you're going to take this, you know, the device away, but coming to you to be able to listen and support and then try to find some guidance. 
The other part of uh, that's not considered cyberbullying, but it happens quite often, is our emotions and, and social media. So kids scroll, adults scroll many times for hours on social media. And they will sit there and it looks like everybody else's life is perfect, right? Their family seems perfect. They get to go on vacations. They just got a new car, a new dog, or, you know, they just got and, you know, accepted into a certain college or onto a, a specific elite soccer team, whatever it may be. And they sit there and they scroll through and they see this girl got more likes on her picture or his girlfriend is hanging out with somebody new or nobody invited them over or they sit there and it's that feeling they it's almost like it kind of takes little pieces away from them of feeling of worth like feeling like they're missing out that they're not good enough that everybody else has it better and what's why is this happening to them and their family or you know, it it can be hard. I mean, adults go through this. If we really stop and think about it, you know, you see people, you know, and younger than me and old, my age and older, but that seem to have this perfect life, right? They continue to, you know, go on trips and get bonuses and raises and move up in the, you know, in the, in the jobs and their kids seem to be doing well and soaring and, and we're struggling in our own life or with our own kids. And it sometimes can feel like, man, how do some people just have it all? And I'm struggling. But the thing is, is if somebody came up and asked you when you're scrolling and they see that on your face, like what's wrong, what, you know, what's going on with you? It can be really hard to put that into words because how do you want to say, well, I just saw so-and-so and they said they just lost 40 pounds. They look great, but I'm struggling right? Doesn't seem fair. It's hard to put those into words the same way with kids is that they don't know how to put it into words of how they're feeling when they feel like they're being left out or they see this family that's not divorced and they're like, well, it's not fair. Sometimes they don't want to say that. And so if you do see them, give them, you know, a, a few minutes of break and just say, I see you're, you know, you seem down and, you know, and talk to them about maybe some things you've struggled with on social media too, with, with seeing other things happening, because the more real we can be with them, the better off they are to be able to talk to us. So how bullying impacts the brains. Um, a lot of times I think we're getting it much more now, but many times it was like, it, it really, you know, sticks and stones, right? Th those don't matter to us. It's, you know, if somebody hits us, punches us, yes, that, that's the big stuff. Well, honestly, they've done so much research now showing that it does impact repeated bullying does impact children's brains. Their brains and brain scans can look like children who have been sexually or severely physically abused. They can respond to everyday stress like combat soldiers with post-traumatic stress disorder. The thing is, we want to make sure that we don't blow these experiences off. Don't act like that they don't exist. If we start taking steps to be able to work through these through school, at home, in different areas, we can make sure that kids know that what they're going through is important, their, their feelings matter, and giving them some steps of what to do, how to be able to work through this so that we don't have these lifelong um, issues with children. This was a study that was done, and this study shows adult strategies that are least likely to have positive effects, most helpful, and then what varied. So things that varied were direct um, efforts or intervention in schools. So that was like supervision in the hallway or the other kid getting punishment or consequences. It depended on how it was done within that school. The one that is the least likely from us as adults is the you should have. Um, they told me it wouldn't have happened if I would have acted differently, told me to stop tatt tattling, which is the most harmful as an adult. The most helpful was when they listened to me, encouraged me, and checked back with me over time to make sure I was okay. 
peer strategy. So we've always told kids to stand up, right? Um, to be that upstander. Well, we want to make sure that they're doing it in the right ways. Confrontation was least positive. So if a situation is happening and there is a, a person walking in the hallway, if they go up and they aggressively and angrily tell that other kid, stop it, knock it off, or even calmly say it, what happens typically is adults around hear it, adults come out, they'll tell that upstander to kind of, okay, you go back to class. They ask the other two kids, you know, the kid doing the bullying behaviors and the kid that's being targeted, what's going on. And then they send the kid who's been targeted to the counselor's office. And then the other kid usually to the principal's office. This then separates again. And it is why then all of a sudden the kids don't have the right peer support. The ones that um, were most helpful um, was another student walked with me, talked to me or encouraged me, gave me advice, helped me get away, made a distraction. So instead of going up and grabbing or doing something, just saying, hey, listen, you want to, you know, we got to get to class and kind of going that way. Um, talked to me at school was really good. Called me at home to encourage her, even if they text, just, hey, how are you doing? Those were positive support strategies for peers. So how do we create a healthy school climate, right? Um, that is easier said than done. So we know that in positive school climates that they do, do students do better academically, fewer risky behaviors. Um, they feel better about themselves. They attend school more and they engage in less bullying and other um, problem behaviors. One thing to understand, especially if it's parents, is that when can schools intervene? There are certain expressions that are not protected by the First Amendment and allow for intervention or discipline. So if a bullying situation happens outside of school or cyberbullying, and it does not do any of these things, the schools are not going to intervene because it's not on school property, it's not interfering, uh, substantial and materially disrupting the learning environment, interfering with educational process or school discipline. Um, if it's not utilizing school-owned technology, or threatening other students or infringing on their civil rights, then the schools will not intervene if it's happening outside of school and it does not um, inter or does not use any of these tools. Some strategies, okay? So when we talk about consider, uh, consider the school climate, it means looking at the whole entire norms, attitudes, and behaviors. Um, training is so important, and I know that's hard in schools right now with lack of staff and lack of time, And but training is so crucial to make sure that we are all being consistent in all walks of an entire school system from lunchroom to classroom to office staff to buses. We have to make sure, even after school training, um, make sure that we're all on that same page. Family involvement is really important to try to get family educated, parents educated. And through things like this that the special school district is doing is phenomenal. Um, updating school policies, making sure that the school policies are all updated on anti-bullying and making sure that we send that out to parents and students multiple times throughout the year. And then collecting data, um, gathering some information to be able to get a community-wide um, idea on where people are feeling at with um, bullying, what their thoughts are, what they feel works and what doesn't work. Validating students, it is probably the number one most crucial thing and it doesn't take a lot of training and it doesn't cost anything, which means all we do is actively engage and listen to students and their needs non-judgmentally. Um, implement prevention programs. This can be education awareness, um, adult involvement, increase adult supervision in the school wherever we're feeling there are situations that are happening. A lot of times when you do surveys, you can find out from the student body 
where these things seem to be happening. And then you can be able to then set up more adult supervision in areas that maybe you weren't aware of before. And then certainly offering services, identifying families and students that need these services. So services from the outside um, agencies to be able to provide services is crucial in these in school systems. This video um, is a really good video to be able to give us clear guidelines on what to be able to do if you encounter a student who is being bullied. We all know schools are a primary place where bullying can happen. About 22% of students aged 12 through 18 report being bullied at school. Middle school is a tough time for kids. They're moving from childhood to adolescence. They're becoming more independent and want to make choices for themselves. Friends and social circles are increasingly important. Helping to establish a supportive and safe school climate where all students are accepted is key to making sure all students can learn and grow. School staff can help prevent bullying before it happens and stop bullying if it's already happening. Both what you do and what you don't do can help stop bullying. Let's start with what not to do. Don't ignore it. Don't think kids can work it out without adult help. Don't immediately try to sort out the facts. Don't force other kids to say publicly what they saw. Don't question the children involved in front of other kids. Don't talk to the kids involved together, only separately. Don't make the kids involved apologize or patch up relations on the spot. Now here's what you should do. Intervene immediately. Separate the kids involved. Make sure everyone is safe. Address any immediate medical or mental health needs. Stay calm. Reassure the kids involved, including bystanders. Model respectful behavior when you intervene. When adults respond quickly and consistently to bullying behavior, they make it clear that bullying is unacceptable. Remember these steps to stop bullying on the spot so you can help keep kids safe. We all know school. Schools are our primary. So that there are tons and tons of resources on stopbullying.gov. And it can be for parents and educators. And sometimes digging into it can start making your head spin when you're trying to find um, what are some best practices or different things. So you can always contact our foundation uh, as we are digging into these things <clears throat> excuse me, all of the time. But the, the final thing that I, if I can give to every parent and educator out there is validating feelings. Many times, all people want to do, and this is us as adults too, when we are going through something, we don't want somebody when our emotions are heightened when we're embarrassed or mad or hurt, whatever it may be, we don't want somebody saying, just ignore it, or you're overreacting, or just go sit down, or, you know, all of the different things, or trying to fix it. You know, if you just sit down, it'll be fine tomorrow. What we all want is we just want somebody to validate how we feel. It does validate does not mean that you have to agree with their feelings, their actions. It just simply means that if a student comes up to you and says, so-and-so just took my, took my stuff or, you know, called me a name, instantly we want to do it before of like, wait, so-and-so, did you do this? Did you take that? Give it back now. Sit down, leave each other alone. Instead, if they do come up to you and you can tell they're upset, say, okay, talk to me. What's going on? listen to them, just actively listen. Once they're done telling you, then you validate how they feel. I feel that you're embarrassed, or I feel that you feel they disrespected you. You know, as of right now, what can I do to be able to help you, right? Is, you know, if it's not happening right at that moment in that class, and it was in the hallway, 
do you think that, are you okay to sit down and finish class? Do I need to, do you want to go talk to a counselor? But listening to them, validating their feelings only means that now they can take a little bit of a deep breath. Their head is not all over the place. And then they can start thinking about things. And we want them to start thinking about, okay, what can I do on my own? Now that I've taken a deep breath, at least they've heard me, right? They've understood me. It is so absolutely crucial to be able to listen and validate. And it's probably my number one thing um, because it can help the relationship between children and educators and parents. It, it's amazing if you just try it. Try it the next time that you normally wouldn't have done it and see if over time it does get better. So our foundation is local. Um, we are always available um, to be able to answer any questions that you may have. If you have a, a, a child that's struggling or going through bullying and you want some support, we don't charge anything. If you're an educator and you need some you know, activities or exercises or things, just questions, you can certainly call us and we'll give you any supports that we can. And I'm just grateful for Adrian and the special school district allowing us to be able to, to present today. And we want to really thank you for um, creating this opportunity to learn from you and with you today um, for our district and our families. We also want families here in special school district to know that there are several resources available to them. Um, you mentioned them also on our website that there are options for them to learn more um, from different agencies, from stopbullying.gov, Stop the National Bullying Prevention Center. Um, we have books and articles and things available for families to learn with us, um, and we are ready to serve. There are also various ways to report any of your concerns in an anonymous way. So please know that if you visit any of our websites or our district website, you can use this QR code on the screen as well to get supports for your student and our family. We are here to help and we want you to know that you are never alone. So even though it's a very small thing that we're doing on um, October the 18th, we are join, joining in solidarity to wear orange so that our young people, our community knows that we take this very seriously. We wanna support our students and support our families. So please join us um, for various events. You can contact FACE to learn more about our offerings. But Tina, we wanna thank you once again for sharing your experience, Megan's story with us and all of the strategies and supports that are available. Thank you so very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. This concludes our webinar. We thank you for being here with us, and we look forward to speaking with you again. Have a great day.